Good evening. It's good to see everybody back. Welcome. Um, I was grateful for my brother thinking of those things to pray for, um, and it's good to remember uh, this past year and think ahead to the new year. It seems like every year the, the um, end of the year sneaks up on me. It's like, <laughs> I can't believe the year is already over. And uh, so I feel as though in one sense we're sort of hobbling across the finish line uh, for the year prior. At the same time, we're trying to get plans made for the, <laughs> the coming year. Uh, it's always just a, an interesting stretch of time here at the end of the year. But uh, we have so much to be thankful for. I mean, um, so much to be thankful for. And it's so easy to uh, take those things for granted and I really don't want us to, to do that. We've been given so many blessings and we have so much uh, given to us by God, um, just uh, his grace to us, his blessing on this church. Uh, I don't want that to um, just wither here. Uh, we need to commit ourselves and uh, prepare for um, just fervent, faithful service in the new year, uh, really striving to honor him, really striving to grow up in our knowledge of him. Uh, so we need to be thinking about uh, 2020 now as well and uh, uh, what that year holds for us. And just um, I think a text like this in Judges 5 will help us to consider that. But we are tonight uh, in Judges chapter 5, if you'll turn there with me in your Bibles. Back in Judges, after a brief break, and uh, tonight, uh, the title of our sermon is A Victory Song of Celebration. A Victory Song of Celebration from Judges chapter 5. It's a joy to be in this book together. I enjoy uh, this study of Judges. I pray it's helpful to you. It certainly has been helpful for me. Uh, it's just nice to consider from these historic narratives in the Bible uh, the lessons that God has for us. And there are several here in Judges chapter 5. This is going to be part one. And we will uh, look at this text probably over two, maybe three sermons, probably two sermons, uh, probably three sermons. And then we'll see how that goes. Uh, and uh, working through uh, the whole chapter, uh, but chapter five really is a retelling of uh, the events of chapter four and the victory there won by the Lord. And so I want to read the chapter to us and then we'll get into the text. So Judges chapter five, beginning in verse one. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, when leaders in Israel lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai, before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anat, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak, you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, and who walk along the road. Far from the noise of the archers, among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Machir, rulers came down. And from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As Issachar, so was Barak, sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Ta'anak by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away, that ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. 
Curse Meraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water. She gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. And she pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. And at her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. At her feet, he sank. He fell. And where he sank, there he fell dead. The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil? To every man a girl or two. For Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of a looter. Thus, let all your enemies perish, O Lord. But let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. And so the land had rest for 40 years. It's an awesome song, isn't it? Let's pray together. Consider the text. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this time together tonight. Thank you for the blessing, the privilege of uh, considering this song, this song of victory, victory song of celebration here that Deborah and Barak sang in that day. And it's a joy for us tonight, Lord, to consider uh, this victory that you have afforded your people by grace and mercy to them. Uh, when they were undeserving, Lord, like we are, uh, like your people are, so undeserving, and yet you, Lord, mighty to save. Um, willing to deliver, gracious and merciful. And we're thankful to you, Lord, for this. Thank you for this truth uh, that this presents to us in your word. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, put our faith and our trust in you, our deliverer, our savior, our rock, our refuge, that we would commit ourselves, our hearts willingly, offer ourselves willingly to you, uh, knowing, Lord, that you always lead us in triumph in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for uh, this blessing tonight of considering this text, help us to understand, Spirit of God, uh, pierce our hearts with truth from your word. Lord, help us to honor you in the way that we live for you as your people, uh, called by your name, under your rule. We're grateful, Lord, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Judges chapter 5, a victory song of celebration. Um, we recently completed our study now of Judges chapter 4. And in Judges chapter 4, the account of Deborah, Barak, and Jael, and then God's deliverance of the nation of Israel from the harsh oppress oppression, the way the Bible describes it, it describes it as a severe oppression that they suffered at the hands of Jabin, king of Hazor, and the Canaanites. And so tonight, we have an opportunity then to celebrate this victory with them. They were given victory, deliverance by the Lord God, and we, in studying Judges 5, get to partake of that uh, celebration, so to speak, in looking at this song together from Judges chapter 5. And instantly, when we think of celebrating this story, or when the Israelites break out in song over this deliverance that God gives them, has given them, someone might initially stand up and object to the whole thing. Uh, what is there in this to celebrate? It's a, it's a scandal. The whole thing is a scandal. There's a woman in Israel sitting in the seat of Moses. Uh, there's a weak and faithless man leading the armies of Israel. Tens of thousands are dead. And at the climax of the account, there's this lying seductress who lures a man into her tent, deceives him, lulls him into a false sense of security, and then drives a stake through his skull. Right, the whole thing is a scandal. What in the world is there to celebrate? So do you think this calls for a celebration? Absolutely, it calls for a celebration. Absolutely, it calls for a celebration. Whenever God's enemies are overthrown, God's people rejoice, right? We are to rejoice when God's enemies are overthrown. And when we think about the, the, the context of our account in Judges chapter 4, what happens at the hand of Jael is just and righteous and ultimately is considered a righteous act of the Lord overthrowing his own enemies, delivering his people. The Bible records the celebration in the form of a song in Judges chapter 5, the song of Deborah. Now, Deborah pens the song, but ultimately, we have to remember that even though Deborah may have penned this song, this is a song of celebration inspired by the Spirit of God Himself. It is the Spirit of God who is 
authoring this song of celebration in Judges chapter 5. And God's people rejoicing over God's deliverance and his victory over his enemies. And as we'll see, uh, recorded in the song of Deborah, oftentimes that victory, that song of celebration, comes with some taunting and some mocking of his enemies. His enemies are unworthy to stand before him. Why do the nations rage? Why do they gather themselves together, right? Against the Lord and against his, his anointed. And what does the Lord do? He sits in the heavens and he laughs. He holds them in derision. And this is what he's doing here with his enemies in Judges chapter 5. Now that being said... There's nothing sanitized about this account. Uh, it's not clean in that respect. It's not sanitized. It's not polite. This wouldn't be uh, fodder for polite conversation over the dinner table. It should be, but not in our day. We tend to want to sanitize these things. We're not allowed with Judges chapter 4, Judges chapter 5, we're not allowed to sit in the safe confines of our air-conditioned room on a chair with a cushion and read the record of their deliverance like we're reading a fairy tale. Or like we're watching a Disney movie or reading a child's story. It's not the way that we're to consider these things. Our God is not a Disney character, right? Our God is not a superhero. <laughs> Our God, the Israelites aren't innocent victims. The Canaanites aren't a marginalized or oppressed people group. Jael doesn't have a pot roast in the oven. And you're not to turn your head before the hammer comes down. Our salvation, sin and salvation, is a bloody business. It's a serious business. It's a deathly serious business. And often we have a tendency, don't we, to sort of read these things with a safe distance between us and the account, right? Um, we're, we sort of stand back and we look at it from afar as if it's a, a good story, a nice tale, a nice yarn that is spun, right? Right? But it doesn't impact us because we're not there. We're not in the thick of the battle. We're not blood and guts in the trenches fighting the battle ourselves. And we, sometimes we don't see the seriousness of it because of that. We tend to insert in accounts in the Bible dealing with sin and dealing with judgment, dealing with um, death and dealing with oppression and dealing with these things. We tend to insert a certain experiential or emotional distance between ourselves and the events that are revealed to us in a biblical account like this one. And we tend to consider it all at a safe distance. We keep it at a 10 foot, you know, with a 10 foot pole, keep it at, ar at arm's length. And something of the truth of it all is lost over that distance. Something of the truth of it all, the grit of it all, the reality of it all is lost over the distance. If you consider, Many things in the Bible like that. When we began our study in Judges and we talked about the ban, the doctrine of harem, so to speak, uh, men, women, and children, and animals too, all put under the ban, destined for death by God as judgment against their sin. And we somehow sanitize sin and idolatry and rebellion against God, and we keep that at, at arm's length, and we fail to consider the seriousness of that. Every man, woman, and child in Canaan put under the ban. Uh, like Phineas, we tend to gloss over Phineas going into the tent of the Israelite with a Midianite woman and putting his spear through them. We tend to Look at it with a distance or with a, a cavalier attitude. Korah and all of those with him swallowed up alive into the earth, went down into the pit alive as judgment against their rebellion. It's not unlike how many children's books relate stories in the Bible like David and Goliath. Right? Bright colors, neat little cliches, platitudes about David's faith and Goliath, this big enemy. Right? But what tends to be missed are the blasphemous taunts of this world represented in the giant Goliath. What tends to be missed is the, the conquering faith of God's victor, David, even though he was small and insignificant and weak, the least among all his brothers. And ultimately what is missed is what God does to his enemies, what God does to his enemies. And not many Sunday school retellings and with David chopping off the head of Goliath with his own sword and his boot upon Goliath's neck, right? Doesn't tend to end that way, but that's the way the story ends. That's the way that God tells the story of his victory over his enemies. 
Now, contrary to how most people tend to think about accounts like this in the Bible, there is no safe distance. You and I, because we're sitting in an air-conditioned room, you're sitting on a cushioned chair, and you're comfortable and well-fed after a nice day of fellowship meals and warm discussions with one another, you're not safe. You're not at a safe distance if you're outside of Christ. If you enjoy any safety, any refuge at all, it's because you're in Christ. But our God is not safe. There is no safe distance. Sin is a foul stench in his nostrils. God will destroy his enemies. Blood will flow. Birds will feast on the flesh of his enemies. God will overthrow all those who stand opposed to him. And you, brother, you, you are his enemy if you're not in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing safe, nothing sanitized about the bloodletting that took place at the cross. The undiluted wrath of God poured out on his own son on account of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Then what do you think that God will do to those who reject him, who refuse him? When God destroys his enemies in devastating severity, when he drives a stake through the head and drives it into the ground, God's people don't stand back in a righteous sort of at a righteous distance with a uh, a self righteous shock, um, some self imposed veil of of incivility about the whole thing. People don't just stand back sort of aghast at what what God does when God overthrows his enemies. What do the people of God do? The people of God sing. (laughs) They sing in victory. They sing in triumph. They understand God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's justice. They understand the exceeding sinfulness of sin. To some degree, God's people understand the rightness of it all, and they sing. They sing a song. They celebrate God's victory. They praise him. Consider the Israelites delivered from Pharaoh and his army in Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. After God destroyed Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, right, um, trailing off after Israel, and they sought to destroy Israel, they're in the middle of the Red Sea. God brings the waters back over their head, killing all those men, overthrowing his enemies. What do the people do? They sing. Listen to Moses in verse 1. He says, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captives are also drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. And all God's people say, praise God, right? Amen. That God overthrows. God is mighty over all his and, by association, our, if you're in Jesus Christ, our enemies. God is victorious. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, and he will triumph. Psalm 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, O God, the psalmist says. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. Psalm 149, verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments upon the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all the saints. The saints counted an honor to execute God's judgment and to sing praises to him in victory. If you've ever watched uh, Handel's or listened to Handel's Messiah, the chorus of hallelujahs in Handel's Messiah, the chorus of hallelujahs that ring from the mouth of the saints in Revelation 19 begin as God takes his vengeance upon this world. And what do the people of God do? They sing hallelujahs of praise to our victorious God. Now, there's nothing politically correct about that. (laughs) We tend to bristle against that truth, 
uh, in our politically correct, sanitized, and uh, so-called civil civilization. Nothing politically correct about it by this world's standards. But that's because this world, and frankly, many professing Christians, have no understanding, no biblical understanding of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. God will judge. God will not entertain rivals. God will overthrow his enemies. And that day where there will be full and final victory over all the the enemies of God uh, is coming, and it will come at the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in victorious return. We are a people of unclean lips. We live among a people of unclean lips. And sometimes, being a people of unclean lips, living amongst a people of unclean lips, we lose perspective. Uh, We lose perspective. What God has done is just and righteous and good. What God, the workman, does through Jael, holding the workman's hammer, is good and righteous and just, and he should be praised for it. And all of those who act as Sisera acts should turn from their sin and rebellion against him and bow the knee to the, the Lord God, creator of all the heavens and the earth. The people of God sing praises to him now in Judges chapter 5. Listen to Judges chapter 5, verse 1. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day a song, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Now notice first, notice first from verse 1 and 2, that when God's people are blessed by the Lord, when they receive the benefit of deliverance, right, when they stand in the glory of victory, in the glory of God's salvation, mind, heart, tongue, unite together in praise, right, unite together here in song, and it is right and good that they should do so. When Deborah and Barak begin their song in verse 2, Their mind, their heart, their tongue are united together in praise of God who has given them the victory. Now, here, if you notice, uh, this is spontaneous and this is instantaneous. Verse 1, it says, on that day. (laughs) On that day. God gives them the victory. And how did Deborah and Barak respond? They respond by singing praise to God. They didn't convene a council. They didn't get together in committee. They didn't take a few weeks to write something out and... Right? They sang. They sang proclamation, instantaneous, uh, spontaneous. On that day, they gave God the praise for the victory that he had given them. You and I, in the same way, much the same way, have been given glorious victory in him. Have we not? We looked at that text in first, our 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where the Lord always leads us in triumph, in Christ. We are more than conquerors through him. We've been given a great deliverance. We stand in victory. Week in and week out, we stand in victory. How should we respond? With exuberant, enthusiastic, heart bursting forward, bursting over, reveling, rejoicing song. We should sing. We should praise. We should worship. Amen? It should be instantaneous, it should be spontaneous, it should be enthusiastic, it should be fervent. We should fervently, enthusiastically, rejoicingly, overwhelmingly burst out in song of praise to God for the victory that he's given us in Christ. And what we tend to do is we tend to keep things at a, you know, a a little bit of a distance, a little bit of politeness, uh, don't want to sing too loud, my voice isn't that good. I'm not always exactly on key, right, Tyler? I'm not always going to be, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I can't really. D- Listen, that, that's, that's not the way that we should sing. <laughs> we should sing out fervently, enthusiastically, exuberantly, extolling our God, praising him for the victory that he's given us in Christ. We have been given victory. We should praise like it. And we tend to forget. We tend to, 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 the only word I could really think of to sort of explain what we do when it comes to that is we sort of sanitize the whole thing. We put a bit of a wet blanket over it. We try to calm it all down, tamp it all down. Listen, we don't want to be fanatical. 
Yes, we do. <laughs> we should be fanatical. Look at what God has done for us. <laughs> Look at the salvation he's given us. We should sing out, right? We should be exuberant in our praise, exuberant in our fellowship, exuberant in our joy. And we should extol our God. Don't sanitize. Don't dilute. That's what it is. It's diluted. It's tempered. And we shouldn't be tempered. We should be enthusiastic. I'm going to keep using that word over and over again because I can't think of another word to use. We should be enthusiastic in our worship and praise of God. Right? All this victory that we've been given should promote, should motivate, should fuel an untempered, undiluted, exuberant praise of God's people. Don't sanitize. Don't dilute your praise. Uh, we need to remember that when we come in for worship on the Lord's Day, when we sing songs together, when we pray, when we worship together, when we see one another at groups during the week, right? In our praise of Him, we should be enthusiastic. That enthusiasm, that fervent praise and worship will overflow, bubble out into our service and obedience to Him and faithfulness to Him. Our obedience to Him should be enthusiastic. Our following after Him should be enthusiastic. Our prayer during our devotional time should be enthusiastic. Our worship of Him as we read His Bible, either individually, alone, or with God's people in the church on the Lord's Day, should be enthusiastic. Should be, and it's to our shame, isn't it, that it isn't? None of us does that perfectly. We all struggle with that. We've got to remember the reality of what has been done for us and stop tamping down our worship and praise. It needs to be tamped up. Uh, we need to tamp it up. <laughs> as this song of praise progresses in Judges chapter 5, we'll hear of the tribes who went into battle. We'll hear of Deborah and Barak and Jael, the army in the valley of the Kishon. But verse 2, verse 2 acknowledges the rightful, sovereign, providential source of such instrumental means, right? Those tribes that went into battle, Deborah and Barak and Jael in the valley of the Kishon, but when the rulers take charge and when the people make a total commitment of themselves, that's what it means there in verse 2 when Deborah recounts that the people willingly offer themselves, means that the people make a total commitment of themselves, of themselves, then what are we to do? We're to bless the Lord. We're to see that as a grace of God and we're to bless Him. We see it as a work of His Spirit and we praise Him. Bless the Lord. In other words, God is the cause of it. God's the cause of it. We can look around our church, as we have been praying earlier tonight, how grateful for we are for all that the Lord has done. The Lord has blessed us beyond what we could think or imagine. Um, he has preserved us and matured us and grown us and kept us. And the Lord has been so good to us, so good to us. The Lord is the cause of all of that. It didn't happen because of this or that or the other means it may have come through some instrumentality, but the source of all that blessing is the Lord. The source of that grace is the Lord. Bless His name, right? Bless Him. Praise Him. In other words, He's the cause. He gets the praise. He's the one who moves the hearts of the people. So, verse 3, Deborah says, I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. And we need to pray that the Lord would move the hearts of his people here. That we as a church, that we as a church would be moved to willingly offer ourselves consecrated to God for his service. We need to pray to the Lord for that. Right? We can motivate one another. We should. We should hold one another accountable. We should charge one another. We should exhort one another daily while it is called today. And all the more so as that day approaches, we should continue to do those things. But who is the cause of that taking place? God is the cause. We need to depend upon him, cry out to him that he would bless us in that and that he would move his people to willingly con consecrate themselves, offer themselves, give themselves to the service of God. Uh, he's the one who does it. He's the one who gets the praise. This expression in verse 2, willingly offering themselves, this expression of love and devotion is rare in the book of Judges doesn't happen very often. It is rare in our day, is it not? It's rare to find a church like this in our day. Very rare. Rare during this period in Israel's history. We need to pray that the Lord would move the hearts of his people in our day 
just like he did in Judges chapter 5, verse 2 here. From there now, the Song of Deborah then divides into a three-part structure, each part distinguished by a contrast. Three parts and a contrast in each part, okay? In part one, there's a contrast between God and Israel. Part one is verses 1 through 12, okay? In part two, verses 13 through 23, there's a contrast between allies and enemies. And then in part three, verses 24 to 30, there's a contrast between Jael and the mother of Sisera. Three parts, three contrasts, okay? In this first section of the song, God is seen in power, verses 4 and 5, contrasted with the Israelites in weakness, verses 6 through 8. God in power, the Israelites in weakness. Now think with me about what this first section says about God's power in verses 4 through 5. The kings and princes being summoned to give ear to Deborah's song of praise in verse 3 are the kings and princes of the earth. Right? Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, verse 3. These are the kings and princes of the earth, namely those of the Canaanite enemy that they just defeated. Deborah essentially sings, listen up, you Canaanites. Listen up, I want you to hear me. The false pagan idol of the Canaanites named Baal was said to have dwelt in the north on Mount Zaphon. It's where Baal, the false pagan idol of the Canaanites, dwelt on Mount Zaphon. He was the god of the nations to the north. Baal controlled the things of the north, so to speak. If you remember from prior sermons, Baal was a fertility god, and Baal also had power over the weather. Baal was a fertility god, had power over the weather, right? Now, it was well known at the time that the one true and living God of Israel entered into covenant with the Israelites at Sinai in the south. So picture yourself. Put yourself in the shoes of Canaanite. Your God dwells in the north, controls the north. He's on Mount Zaphon. Baal is over the north. The Israelites in the south... Their God was the one true and living God of Israel. He came to them, made a covenant with them on Mount Sinai. He's the God of the south. Okay, So the Canaanites would have thought of him as the God of the south. And so what we have here then is more than God simply giving victory to the Israelites over their oppressors, the Canaanites. God shows himself supreme not only over the Canaanites, but victorious over their pagan idol, Baal. Right? You see how that would have worked, God takes victory not only over the Canaanites, but before their eyes, and frankly, before the eyes of the idolatrous children of Israel, God takes victory over Baal himself. There's a humiliation here of their pagan so-called God, as God reigns victorious, not just in the south, but now reigns victorious, also seen to be in the north. Look at verse 4. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured and the clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai, before the Lord God of Israel. Now listen, having entered into covenant with Israel at Sinai in the south, God then from Sinai led them through Seir, verse 4, led them through Edom into the promised land. This is a little bit of a geography lesson. God went from Sinai in the south, through Seir, through Edom, led them into the promised land, and he gave that inheritance generation the promised land under Joshua. He gave them the land of Canaan. He gave them the land of Canaan. And now, in a long line of victories, God proves himself powerful over the fictitious, imaginary gods of this world yet again and defeats Baal before the eyes of the Canaanites. It's interesting, too, in doing this, how does God do it? He does it using the weather. (laughs) To defeat Baal, this fertility god who is in charge of the weather, God uses the weather to defeat this Canaanite pagan idol. He uses the weather, a great torrent. Look at verses 20 and 21. Where the heavens and the clouds poured water, the battle belongs to the Lord. Now this, in addition to, to defeating the Canaanites, defeating their worthless, pagan, false idol. God also did this before the eyes of these idolatrous Israelites who were constantly ensnared by Baal worship. 
Why were the Israelites under oppression in the first place? Why were they delivered over into the hand of Jabin, king of Hazor, and the Canaanites? It was because of their idolatrous worship of Baal. God's people, the Israelites, had given themselves to idolatry. They were continuously ensnared by Baal worship in Canaan. The emancipation generation in the wilderness would fail to trust him. The inheritance generation would take the land and yet fail to pass along their faith to the next generation. The next generation would then fall headlong into sin, into idolatry. And with each successive generation, the pattern would be repeated. And it's repeated in our day, right? It's repeated in our day. Like the Israelites, we need heart reformation. Moral reformation simply will not take. It will not work. We need heart reformation, heart transformation. That's what these Israelites need. We need the Spirit of God applying the benefits of our redemption, benefits of our redemption won by Jesus Christ at the cross. It's the only hope for anyone to be saved from sin and the wrath of God is to have the person and work of Jesus Christ applied to them inside out, like God transforming our heart by a work of his Spirit. And God is seen here in power, um, rescuing these Israelites from their entrapment to idolatry. Now, in contrast with the power of God, power of God walking through Canaan, so to speak, defeating the Canaanites and defeating the Canaanite God, in contrast with the power of God, Deborah next sings of the weakness of Israel. What had been the consequences of their sin? Look at verse 6. In the days of Shamgar... The son of Anat, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. The NASB says by roundabout ways. They walked by roundabout ways. Now Shamgar, think with me, verse 6, Shamgar and Jael are both Gentiles. Jael is a Gentile woman and God gives deliverance through Shamgar and Jael. Shamgar here in verse 6 is mentioned as a son of a gnat. If you remember that from looking at Shamgar, uh, that cult of a gnat was a cult that worshipped the goddess consort of Baal. So this was a mercenary, Gentile, cult-worshipping pagan that God used to rescue or deliver his people. Uh, This would have been an outright rebuke to Israel. It would have been a shameful circumstance. And yet this is what God does to deliver his people, to point a finger, as it were, at their sin and rebellion, that God could use this Gentile to deliver them. Under the severe oppression of the Canaanites, the Israelites in verse 6 couldn't even travel along the main trade routes or highways. They couldn't go out and walk along the roads. They had to sneak around evasive byways. They had to avoid thugs and thieves. They had to take the roundabout ways, so to speak. Couldn't even walk along the road. Couldn't walk down the road of their street, so to speak. Had to sneak out the back door and go through the woods. Verse 7, village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. The sense is from this word in verse 7 is that it was held back. That village life, trade, was held back. They couldn't walk around in the open. Instead, they were forced inside. Trade came to a halt. The markets shut down, so to speak, for the Israelites. Uh, The Israelites became cut off. Essentially, they became home-ridden, right? Bound, house-bound, and couldn't go out. Liberties were taken from them. Now, these liberties that they shared when they first came into the land were not guarantees. Just like the liberties that you and I enjoy today are not guarantees. The liberties that we enjoy, uh, the wealth that we enjoy, the comforts that we enjoy, the leisures that we enjoy are not guarantees. Whatever liberty we enjoy is entirely a gift of God, entirely by His grace. And we tend to forget. That was always the admonition or the warning that Moses gave the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. You'll go into the promised land, Israel. You'll dwell in paneled houses that you didn't build, in cities that you didn't fortify. You'll dwell there in safety and in security and in leisure and in comfort. And what was the warning? You will forget the Lord your God. And Moses warns, when you forget the Lord your God, you're going to be brought into judgment. That's exactly, exactly 
what's happened here. They forgot the Lord their God. They failed to acknowledge Him as the giver of their comforts and gifts. And they act, they act like they're owed something or somehow that it's the normal state of things for us to be comfortable. And we think of all of human history up until this time in human history, up until now, right, our generation. And think about all the comforts and the technological advances that we enjoy. Uh, you can go to the doctor and get a prescription for just about anything that ails you. You have a throbbing pain in the second digit of your right pinky. There's a medicine specifically designed for the throbbing pain in the second digit of your right pinky, right? It's like they're, they're, we, the, the phones and the computers and the TVs and all that we have, the luxuries that we enjoy, we tend to take them for granted. It is like this in no other time in history, but now wealthier than we've ever been, more at comfort than we've ever been, more at leisure than we've ever been. And you know what? Sometimes, folks, we tend to act like it. We tend to act like we're comfortable, like we're at leisure, like we're fat and happy on a couch, not willing to do anything, not willing to recognize or acknowledge that God is the giver of these good and perfect gifts and that we should be employing them for his service, for his glory, right? We should willingly offer ourselves, right? Rather than taking the gifts of God that we have and consuming those gifts on our own lusts, we should be willing to consecrate ourselves willingly to him and employ those things in his service, right? Giving ourselves enthusiastically, exuberantly, rejoicingly, celebrationally, <laughs> giving ourselves to the worship and service of God. The, the Israelites here forgot him. They thought that all their comfort, all that they had, was the normal state of things, and they're found sort of mocking or scorning that things will be as they always have been, right? Where's the promise of his coming? <laughs> and they forget the flood. Um, they believe that things would just continue as they always had. They gave themselves over to idolatry. Village life ceased. It could be at any given time that village life ceases in Orlando. That market ends, trade ends, that our liberty to freely conduct ourselves ends. We know from the Bible that that time is coming. The Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, warns us that that day will come when these things cease and the people of God are persecuted, persecuted such that if it were possible for the elect to fall away, they would. Right? The Lord warns us of such persecution. And yet, it was at that time, in their need, under their oppression, the hand of the Canaanites, that caused the children of Israel to cry out to God again for mercy. Um, let us not wait. Let us continue to cry out God for, to God for mercy. Let us be thankful to him for all he's given us. And let us consecrate ourselves, willingly offer ourselves in service to him. So village life ceased then. In verse 7, Deborah says, Until I... Deborah arose, arose a mother in Israel. Deborah would become the means through which God would exhibit his care, his protection, his love for the nation, even while they were in rebellion against him. Uh, she was called a mother in Israel, like Paul among the Thessalonians, right? A nursing mother who cherishes her own children. What do the Israelites do? Verse 8, they chose new gods. The NIV has it wrong here, God choosing new leaders. It's not what's being communicated in verse 8. The people of Israel, simple past, term, past tense verb, the people of Israel chose idolatry. They chose new gods, verse 8. Then there was war in the gates, and not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Do you see the contrast? Right? The power of God and all that God could do without a one of them to help and the weakness of the, of the Israelites, who among 40,000 couldn't find a shield or a spear. You could say they couldn't lift a finger to defend themselves. They've gotten things horribly bad in Israel. They couldn't provide for themselves. They couldn't get, in, get around in the land, the land that God had given them. 
The land that God had promised them, the land that was theirs by right, their inheritance, they couldn't even walk freely in the land. There was an absence of leadership among the people, all due to their irrational persistence in idolatry. This stupid, deaf, dumb, pagan, idol, Baal that God takes out in a flash with no problem whatsoever, right? Just dispenses this enemy. They suffered war in the very land given them as a gift from God and they couldn't raise a shield or a spear in defense of themselves. And so this first section ends. Contrasting the power of God and the weakness of the people. Deborah closes this section by singing as she did in verse 2. My heart, verse 9, my heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. You see the bookends here, the inclusio, between these two facts, that the people willingly offered themselves, and the cause of that, all the praise for that, goes to God. Bless the Lord. Speak, verse 10, you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, who walk along the road. These aren't the ones who can't walk along the road. These aren't the oppressed Israelites. These are wealthy Canaanites who think themselves to be safe and secure in the land, who forget the one true and living God of Israel. Verse 11, far from the noise of the archers, among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. They're going to be talking about all that the Lord has done for Israel in his victory over the Canaanites. Then, then the people of the Lord shall come out of their houses. They shall walk down the highways and they will go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake. Sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. And let us in light of this example given to us for our admonition, let us, as they did, offer ourselves willingly with the people. Amen? Commit. We're not at liberty to lounge. It is not safe for us to lounge. We need to consecrate ourselves, offer ourselves willingly, and bless the Lord and see the Lord work mightily through that for his glory. All the praise belongs to the Lord our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you that you are victorious. Uh, You, Lord, are a God of war. You conquer and are victorious. You've conquered our enemies, Lord. You have given us the victory in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we, Lord, uh, help us by your Spirit to march on in strength, to uh, march on in victory, to consecrate ourselves, to willingly offer ourselves in enthusiastic, exuberant service of the one who has given us this victory. Help us, Lord, by your Spirit to praise you as you are worthy to be praised, to serve you, to obey you as you are worthy to be served and obeyed. And help us, Lord, to take joy in these things, to celebrate these things, to to rejoice in them. Lord, what a, a glorious victory that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of celebrating here uh, with this song in Judges chapter 5. And help us to consider these things and may it inform and fuel our faith and our worship for your glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen.